I want to say that the person who hurts your child is not a stranger. Your child's perpetrator is the loving uncle, is the funny uncle, is the funny neighbor. Your child's perpetrator is somebody who is familiar to the child. My ex-husband and I both come from broken homes. So I, I think we were two broken people who came together. And so I was putting pressure on him. I was looking for a father, I was looking for a lover, a husband, a friend, all in one. And I think it was the same for him. Our relationship was based on our insecurities and our pain. By this time, I am deep into depression. Small tasks like just even taking a shower for me was so draining. You know, just having basic answering my phone was, it had become such a draining task for me. I go to a place where I couldn't even afford a meal for me and my daughter. And I remember one time she was eating and she asked me, Mom, you're not hungry. Why aren't you eating? Where is your food? I said, I'm not hungry. But I was hungry. It's just that the food wasn't enough for both of us. My name is Vicky Itenyo. I am a mother. I have a beautiful nine-year-old daughter, Naima. Um, I am the founder of Mummies with a Purpose. I was sexually abused as a child. I lost my mother at a very young age. I lost my sister to suicide. Um, I lost my marriage. I'm divorced. I got divorced at a very young age. I have been in a very abusive marriage. I have suffered severe depression. I have been homeless and I'm here to share my story. I grew up in just a normal home. It was in the beginning, it was me and my mom. And then after some time, um, she met a man who then ended up moving in with us. And um, yeah, the relationship grew and together they had a son. And so growing up, it was, I would say things, the dynamics changed a bit when now, when he moved in, and then now when my brother came into the picture. The age difference between me and my brother is eight years. So between 11 and 12 years of age, there's an incident that happened. My stepfather defiled me. And this happened, we were, at that time, we were living with my mother's friend, actually. And I remember I was at home because I had been sent home for school fees, because of school fees. So it was me, and there was another lady called Betty, and then he came in. And so that incident happened. My mother's friend was hosting us. It's, uh, it was a three-bedroom house, and so there was the host's bedroom, and then there's another bedroom, and then now where we were putting up. So it was mid-morning, I can say around 10, 11 o'clock there. Um, there's no one in the house. My mom has gone to work. My young brother has gone to school. My, my mom's friend also is away. So it is Betty and I who are in the house, and Betty was asleep. She was one person who used to, would go out a lot at night. So mostly during the day, she's asleep. And so it happened that my stepdad just walked in. My assumption was he was coming to pick something. And I was just, I was laying in bed actually. Yeah, I was just on the bed. And so he entered the bedroom. He went through his things, picked whatever he was picking. And then he asked me to face the other way because I think he wanted to change. So I turned and faced the wall and he changed. He had this, um, Kikoi. So he tied that Kikoi and then I left the bed to go to the room and then he held me. And so he was like, I want to teach you a dance. And I used to refer to him as Papa. So he said, I, I want to teach you a dance, Vicky. I was like, okay. Because you know, we were not, our relationship has never been good, really, to be honest. So for me, I just felt like, oh, Finally, you have noticed me, you know. 
I would like to teach you a dance. And so that's how it happened. He held me, we were dancing, and he was the one who was singing that song. I even think, now that I think about it later, I think that his singing is what woke Betty up. Yeah. So that happened. We started dancing, and from the dancing, it now translated into something else. After it was over, he left the bedroom, he went to the bathroom, and then he told me to also take a shower. So when he left the bathroom, he came to the bedroom, he changed and he left. So Betty now opened the door when I am on my way to the shower. And so he said, Betty asked me, I thought I heard a man's voice. I said, yeah, that was Papa. He came in and he left. Then Betty asked me, it was just the two of you in that room. I said, yeah. And so now he, she looked at me and because I was with, in a towel, I'm going to take a shower. So Betty asked me, what were you guys doing? And so I explained to her what happened. And so she told me, don't even take a shower. You go and put on your clothes and then we wait for your mom to come from work and you'll explain to her what happened. So my mom comes. Um, after dinner, we were in the bedroom. I explained to her. I tell her this is what happened to me during the day. Because at this hour, I said, remember I mentioned earlier that Betty used to go out a lot. So she wasn't home. I explained to my mom what happened. She was quiet. She called her friend who was hosting us. And then she called me into the room to see, to explain what I had told her. So she asked me, Ebu, 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 repeat what you told me. And so I repeated. And they looked at each other. And then my mom asked me, who else have you told? I said, Betty was here during the day. In fact, you can even ask her because she was here. By telling my mom, I thought she would do something about it. She did nothing. And then this person is constantly, I'm living in, under the same roof with my perpetrator. That was very hard for me as a child, to be honest. And this is why whenever schools would close, I would go to my aunt's place in Langata just to get away from that whole environment. And I ended up opening up to my aunt. So I told my aunt Agnes what happened. And she called my mom and she spoke to my mom about it. And so my mom said I was lying. My mom said I was lying. That never happened. I was... I think for me, what hurt the most was my mother not believing me. And I feel like my aunt knew what was going on, so her door was always open for me. In fact, I remember even just growing up, most people in my aunt's estate thought I was her child because I would constantly be there on school holidays or over the weekend, I would constantly be there. So that became my, my refuge. That was my escape from our home you know, from my mother's house. Yeah, so that went on. My stepfather wasn't very good to me. It was very clear that he was not my father, just from the way he treated, you know, my brother was treated way differently than I was. And so for me, that made me feel like I was left out. Not to say that my mother was not a good mother. She was an amazing woman. And because of that, I, I just found myself more comfortable in Langata, at my Aunt Agnes's house. There, it felt home, I felt safe, I felt loved, you know, I felt included. She treated me like her child, yeah. So when I got to 13, 12, 13 there, I remember um, asking my mom, telling my mom that I would like to know who my dad is, now my biological father. Uh, I had had a conversation with that aunt of mine and so Aunt Agnes said, this is something you need to discuss with your mom first. So I went home, I asked my mom if she can introduce me to my dad or at least tell me where my dad works or even just give me his phone number, I call him. <laughs> and I remember, I remember my mom, I, I told her about that and she was like, okay, sour. She didn't say anything. Then I went outside, I zururad in the estate, I came back in the evening, she said, you want to know who your father is? Yes. Have you ever seen him coming here even with a packet of milk? No. Have you ever seen him in your school paying fees? No. Now this is what I want you to do. Go, go in the bedroom, 
pack your things go and find your father so so at that point I was like hey mama i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i am sorry please forgive me because now honestly i sounded like i didn't appreciate her raising me the reason why i really wanted mainly i really wanted to meet my father is because number one, it was very obvious that this man was not my father just from the way he was treating me right and then i wanted to feel i felt like if i met my dad you know i would be safe like me running to my mom and telling her what happened to me and her doing nothing only meant that i'm not safe here and i am not loved so maybe if i meet my dad he would feel that void so that never happened uh anyway i'm 13 years old one sunday afternoon we are leaving church as we are walking into the estate there is a car parked a blue volvo loud music there is a very tall slender dark man dancing on top of the car with very loud music so as we are approaching where the man has parked my mom stands we slow down and my mom asks me to go and call the guy and i look at her in disbelief because first that man was very drunk <laughs> very loud and i'm just like so i go and call my i go and i go and call him so my mom says you just go i'm standing here nothing will happen to you i go I called the guy. Excuse me, my mother is calling you. And so he looks at me and says, "Hey, go and tell her to come here." <laughs> so as he's talking to me, my mom now shouts his name. He just my mom shouted, "Jim." And so the Jim looked at my mother and looked at me. And I remember he just said he he was in shock. He came down from the car, put off the music, you know he was looking for something to give me there's nothing because he just had <laughs> alcohol in the car and so my mom just stood there and said eh, you have been wanting to meet your father there is your father <laughs> that is how i met my dad for me i was happy it, it sounds very awkward but i was very happy i didn't care if he was drunk i did not care if he was dancing over there his lingala music i didn't care I have finally met my father. You know, and he hugged me, he he started he broke down. So later on is when I understood that maybe he could have been drunk, but for me just seeing him breaking down and hugging me, it was that moment for me. For me that was a prayer answered. Um like I mentioned it was on a Sunday, so my mom showed him our house. He must have gone home and freshened up. He came back in the evening. he brought i think a pizza if i'm not wrong and then he just he said oh tomorrow i'll come to school i'll bring you lunch what do you like i like pizza okay i'll bring you pizza tomorrow that is monday so i went to school as usual kwanza that day i didn't even bother with hot lunch because my father is bringing me pizza so i went to school kwanza my friends my close friends who knew what i was going through in, uh, at home and i remember my english teacher who was very close to me mrs oyombe such a wonderful woman i went to the staff room i told her i met my dad yesterday my dad is coming and she was like yeah you see we have been praying god has answered you see yes my dad is coming so i didn't go for hot lunch i waited for my father 12:45 1 1:30 lunch is over the bell rang my dad didn't show up and i think for me i i have never felt so not wanted like i did that day i have never felt so rejected like i did that day and i went back to class with my friend i remember i was my friend christian wamboy big up if you are watching um and i broke down so we walked back to class i went home and my mom asked me so did you enjoy your pizza did your dad come i said no he didn't show up and she said yeah that's the father you've been wanting to meet in jiuyo that's the type of person he is um he showed up uh, he came that weekend on saturday He came with his wife and my sister. Uh, we went, we had lunch, and that was the beginning of my relationship with my father and my sister. Yeah, 
we he would come pick me up we go to his house and my i must say one thing i'm going to commend my father for is allowing me to have a relationship with my sister allowing us to get to know each other and actually just form a genuine bond that i appreciate my father for so now there's a sense of belonging i feel like okay now i have my father you know i have my sister even if my stepdad whatever he did to me whatever he used to say it never used to bother me much because at the end of the day i used to look forward to the weekends because then my dad would come and pick me up so that's how it was uh, it went on like that until now in 2008 i lost my mom and she had been ailing for quite some time and okay as i grew older we be i began to now become very close with my mom we became very very close we would have very serious intimate discussions but we never ever talked about that incident and i remember even for me and my mom to talk about i never discussed sex with my mother and but we talk about other things. I would tell my mom about my boyfriend. My mom actually was the cool mom in the estate. Our house was a house where anybody would come anytime. There is food, you know, you can hang out at my house. My friends were welcome, those kind of things. She was a real, she was a nice mother. She really was. But we never had any discussion around sex or no. In fact, the person who I had an open discussion with his, my cousin Jojo. Jojo is the one I went to now when I felt, hey, I have a boyfriend. I'm growing up. So Jojo is the one. And Jojo is my cousin from my aunt, where I said I had a refuge. And I remember even throughout my high school, I think, I'm not sure if it was from three or from four, I stayed a whole year with my aunt. A whole year. I took a whole year and I lived with my auntie. I remember even I used to sleep with her <laughs> in her bed. I feel like she understood what I was going through and it, it was just a discussion that my mother was not ready to have. So my mom dies in 2008 and now I'm at a point where I felt alone again. This took me back to again being alone because yes, my father is there, but my father has his family, has his wife. So at this point, I felt the only person I had was my sister. Um, and I remember now my sister at this time had to leave the country and she went to South Africa for studies. So I was just basically alone. This same, same aunt of mine, God bless her, took me in. And so I stayed with her. And I must say, going to, to my aunt's house and just being in that home and being in that environment made me feel wanted, made me feel loved, made me feel very, very important. And throughout my childhood, I was coping because I was always the bad child. I was always, you know, Mimi and you, I've gone to eat in somebody's house. I'm the one who has brought people in the house. And I'm, I was always doing the, the wrong things. So it got to a place where I felt like, Probably I deserved what happened to me, you know. I put myself in that situation because I remember my mom asking, what was I doing in the house at that time? I should have been outside playing. Remember, I was at home because of school fees. So there was nobody to play with at 11 a.m. on a weekday. Everyone is in school. Yeah. So at some point I began to, to understand or to feel like, yeah, probably I deserved everything that has happened to me. And that, is, that was just my punishment. I lose my mother. That was a very, very hard time for me, I must say. Very, very difficult. Because despite me meeting my father, we were not, our relationship was not, we hadn't really quite formed a relationship per se. It was more of me and my sister than me and my dad. So I had to grow up really fast. I remember in 2009, I moved out of my auntie's house, actually, from Langata. Now I started living on my own. I was 21. And, yeah, so I just, I, I, I started living on my own, depending on myself. Yeah, and it was just me. Basically, it was just me against the world. Because, like I mentioned, my sister was away. She wasn't in the country. She had left the country for studies. And then, fast forward, I... I meet my ex-husband. Uh, through this period that my sister is away, my relationship with my father again is strained. 
because now we are not talking as much as we used to. I am not seeing him as much as I used to. Um, my sister comes back and then now my relationship with my dad again is back on track. I meet my ex-husband and that feeling of security. I must say in my life, I think that is the man who genuinely ever made me feel loved and wanted. And I remember even when I shared my incident with my stepfather with him, it was a place of no judgment. It was a place of, of comfort. And he was there for me. And I felt like this was the right man for me because everything about him felt so right and was so right. And we got married. And then I had my daughter in 2011. And I was happy because I remember actually just praying and, and asking God that, you know, God, I come from a broken home. Yeah, so I would not want that for myself. And when I got married, I was so happy. I knew God has answered me. God had answered my prayer. And I got married into a good family. You know, they are good people. So I was like, wow, finally it has happened for me. Yeah, and my marriage went on very well, I must say. But uh, somewhere along the line in 2013, things just started falling apart. There was a strain in, um, in my marriage. We started having arguments a lot. You know, we were not on one accord. Fights were just too many. And eventually in uh, 2015, I remember I had gone to work outside Nairobi. Then when I came back, I just, uh, I called my ex-husband into the bedroom and I told him, you know what, we, we can't, I, I can't do this anymore. One of us has to leave. Uh, I have to mention that my, my ex-husband and I both come from broken homes. Uh, his parents got divorced and then his mother had to leave the country. So I, I think we were two broken people who came together. And so I was putting pressure on him. I was looking for a father. I was looking for a lover, a husband, a friend, all in one. And I think it was the same for him. So at some point, it got so overwhelming. We were, our relationship was based on our insecurities and our pain. So there was pressure. I put pressure on him to be my father, to be my protector, to be my provider, to be my friend, you know, to be all those things. And I think even for him, it was the same way. So it got to a place where my marriage became violent. It was very, very violent. And that is the point where now I knew it was time to leave. I would say the, viol the, the violence was, was, it was a projection of the pain. I, I want to call it a projection of built up anger and built up pain. So you'd realize that there are things I would do that would be a trigger for him. Not because of what I have done, but because it's a trigger. It will take him back somewhere. And there are things he would do that for me would also be a trigger. And this is why I'm saying it again. We were two broken people who came back together and out, came back together because our relationship was just basically founded on pain and insecurities. Yeah, it was just built up pain from our childhood and our anger and, and everything. And so we were just unpacking in the marriage. We were unpacking in the marriage subconsciously. We didn't know, but we were subconsciously unpacking. I would say something and it would remind him something that, you know, maybe his mother did or, or you know, we were unpacking basically. And so it got to a place where it became violent. And then, yeah, I called him and I asked him, I had a conversation with him and it was very candid. It was very... Cordial. I was not angry. I just remember I was so tired. I was tired of being strong. I was tired of pretending I was happy. I was tired. And before I had this conversation with him, I remember speaking to my sister and I was telling my sister, you know, I can't do this anymore. I'm just so exhausted. I remember even the, the first time I opened up to my sister to say that I'm in a violent marriage. My, my sister looked at me like, eh, like, where were we kuchapwa? Because you know me, I'm there fixer like i have things in control so my sister first she was in shock like hi hey, you you can be beaten somebody can beat you 
that's unbelievable. And then also the type of person that my ex-husband is, is a very quiet person. He's a very calm person. So it, it was really, it was very, it took her by surprise. For me, when I got to a place of exhaustion, it was not anger. You know, when you're angry, you can calm down. When you're hurt, you can talk about things and then, you know, solve them. For me, I was tired. I was tired of the violence. I was tired of my pain, personal pain, Kwanzaa. I was just so exhausted. And I was at a space where um, we are not arguing. We are not fighting. I am saying that I want out. So it really didn't matter what he had to say at that point. For me, I had made up my mind. Whatever you want to say, it's fine. And so we separated. And then uh, in 2015, I lost a very close friend of mine called Nana. Um, she lost her life while she was giving birth to her second child. And then in 2015, I lost my sister. And remember, I had lost my mom in 2008. And when I lost my mom, the only person I had was my sister. Then I lose my sister. My sister uh, took her own life. She was uh, suffering from bipolar and clinical depression. So she, she took her own life. Yeah, my sister... She hung herself, let me put it that way. Because of her mental illness history, she had attempted suicide before, severally. And um, occasionally she would cause bodily harm to herself. However, she was, you know, she was making progress. She was making progress. She was on her medication. She was not drinking as much. She looked fine. She looked fine. And so when I just got the call that she was no more for me, I was completely, completely shattered. I was so shattered. I was shattered because I was asking God, what else? What else should I take? Because I've gone through so much in such a short time i would compare myself to my age mates and the things that I, I in fact most people don't even know about some of the things i went through because i was so embarrassed to talk about it and i was so shattered because i just asked god what else my mom you have taken my sister you have taken my marriage has broken what else god cherop cherop is gone like who am i left with and I remember even going to the morgue and just touching my sister's neck. And just looking at her neck just to confirm. To confirm that Julie actually... Uh, that she actually died. And so we... She wanted to be cremated. That was her wish. Uh, so we went to the crematorium and we cremated her. Yeah. And then she rested. So uh, that same 2015, now I was tired also. I remember I, I, I overdosed with antidepressants and vodka. And so after my ex-husband and I separated, we began co-parenting. So he would pick my daughter over the weekends. So this weekend, my daughter is away, my house help is away, and I decided to just also just die because now I'm tired. And I remember even I thought about it and I was like, at least, you know, my, my in-laws are good people. I have a wonderful, wonderful sister-in-law. Naima's aunt is amazing. Her grandparents are amazing. So I was sure my daughter would be okay if I die. So I overdosed that Saturday morning. I drank a uh, vodka and four antidepressants. And I slept. And I remember waking up now Sunday evening. And it is actually my house help who came to wake me up. And so she came. She went for her off. She came back on Sunday. 
I'm asleep. And I remember Naha just sitting on the floor. I woke up and Naomi was on the floor of my bedroom. My door was wide open. And she says to me, hey, Mama Naima, I came, I have called you, I have checked on you, you're breathing, but you're not waking up. I have left your door open, I have even opened your balcony door, you're not waking up. So first I woke up, I didn't think I had slept for so long. In my mind I thought I had maybe slept for a few hours. So I woke up and so she tells me it's, it's Sunday. Obviously I see her in the house so I know it's Sunday because she'd come back on Sundays. So I wake up, I ask her for water, I take my water and I take a shower. And I remember sitting on the bed and having a conversation with God and I told God, now you have refused for me to die. If you have refused for me to die, then you must have a reason. You must, surely you must have a purpose for my life. So yeah, we, I continue coping. All this time I'm coping. I continue coping with my loss. Uh, occasionally break down. Fast forward to 2018, I reach my breaking point where I lose my job now. I had a very nice job. I lose it. To a point where now in 2019, I am completely homeless. I've sold everything in the house. I can't make rent anymore. I can't even, I, there's nothing I can do. So I am homeless. Uh, somebody took us in, my daughter and I. Were hosted by this person. At some point, he became very, very, very cruel to both my child and I. And... I must say, for me being a mother, and I think even anybody who knows me knows how proud I am to be a mom, knows how happy I am to be a mother. Like, whenever somebody would ask these conversations that people have in social settings, what do you do? My answer is always I'm a full-time mom because that is a job I take pride in. Naima for me is a gift. My daughter for me is a gift from God to me. She's a gem. So taking care of her is a job. And I take pride in that. But at this moment, I felt I have failed my child. I go to a place where I couldn't even afford a meal for me and my daughter. And I remember one time she was eating and she asked me, Mom, you're not hungry. Why aren't you eating? Where is your food? I said, I'm not hungry. But I was hungry. It's just that the food wasn't enough for both of us. So I felt like I had failed my child completely because I am at a point where I am so useless to a point where I cannot even afford to, to feed my child, to put a roof over her head. For me, that was my breaking point. And so I remember in 2000, last year, January, because now my host has become very, very mean, very, very cruel. Uh, I went to town, I went to Mfangano Street, I walked into an agrovet. I, I had done my research on Google, actually, about this pesticide. So I went into the agrovet. I speak to the, the first gentleman I met. I explained to him that I have a farm in Kitengela, which obviously was a lie. And I was looking for this pesticide. So he looks at me. He doesn't believe my story. He calls another lady. The lady also listens. Ah, he, she doesn't believe. So I think they called the owner of the agrovet. He was an old muse like this. So the old guy comes and he listens. He asks me, so, umetoka uko kuote. You've come from all that way till town. There are no agrovets. I said, actually, I'm not from the farm. They have just called me when I'm in town. So I said, let me just buy it and go with it. He looks at me. He says, okay. He gave me the dawa, the, the pesticide. And our women, our handbags are very big. So I ensured that I've put that pesticide in a compartment where I will not tamper with it until you know, when it's time for us to take it. My daughter is a lover of chicken. She enjoys her chicken. She loves her chicken. I went, I bought her chicken because it's our last meal on earth. Now we are dying. So I make this chicken for my child. She's, so I'm watching her. She's eating. She's excited. Chewing on her drumstick. I'm just saying, well, we are dying. So she finished her meal. Now I went into my handbag to get the pesticide. We drink and we sleep. Meanwhile, I'm very cautious because also I didn't want something that, I didn't want a very painful death. So this thing, I knew in half an hour, one hour, by the time it's kicking in, Naima is asleep. I, might, I could have felt the effects, but my daughter would have been asleep. And then we die. I looked for it. 
I looked for that medicine. I looked for the pesticide. I went into the trash. I removed the trash. I checked and checked my handbag. I could not find it. I woke my child up to ask, did you enter my handbag? Did you tamper with anything in my bag? And in her sleepy state, she said, no, mom. And she went back to sleep. I looked from 7.30 to 9.30. I looked for that thing. I did not find it. I sat down and now I was having a conversation. Remember in 2015 when I had my first conversation with God, I was lecturing him. Now this time, last year, I was having a conversation with him to say that this is the second time I'm trying this. Wherever that thing has gone, only you know. Please help me. Now for me, last year was a cry for help. Like God, I am here. I have nobody. I'm not dying. So help me. And that is when my help came. My, I met, there's a pastor friend of mine who saw the state I was in and suggested in a very wise way. He said, you know, Vicky, I think you need a break. You just need to go somewhere, take a break. And yeah, from everything. Because by this time, I am deep into depression. I cannot function anymore. I am struggling to be a functional mother. Remember, it is lockdown period. So my child is with me throughout. Yes, we are still co-parenting, but there are those weeks that she would be with me consistently and it would feel like such a burden. You know, just having to wake up, having to just small tasks, like just even taking a shower for me was so draining. You know, just having basic answering my phone was, it had become such a draining task for me. And I remember there was a time that my daughter looked at me and asked me if I was okay. And I think for me, that was a light bulb moment for me that, wait a minute, I'm not fine. Depression is not, it's not like when you have malaria or, you know, like cancer, where you can actually just look at someone and detect, oh, something is wrong. And so for me, because of going back to my childhood, having to cope with living with my perpetrator in the same house, I am coping. My exchange relationship with my father, I am coping. I had become an expert at coping. So as my depression is going on and it's becoming bigger and I'm going deeper, sinking deeper and deeper into depression, I am coping. I am not admitting that I am unwell. I am not admitting that I have issues. I am coping because that is what I know. Remember, this is what I've been doing since I am a child. So bad things happen. You get over them. You move on. And at this point, I got to a breaking point to say that, God, I cannot do this anymore. I didn't care if people were going to laugh at me. I didn't care if people were going to gossip about me. I did not care. I didn't care what anybody was going to say, but I needed God. I knew I needed God. And I knew if I don't cry out to God, I would die. And for me, my, what made me want to get well is just to leave my child. The thought of leaving my Naima, I just couldn't come to terms with it. And so, when Ernest suggested to go to Hope Center, I didn't fight it. I went there with all my belongings. I lied to my child, actually, that um, I've gotten a job. <laughs> I lied to her that I got a job and we have to live there where I work. And so she was excited because, first of all, I must say that I feel like my child went, she was exposed through so much and to a lot at such a young age because my daughter saw me she has been there through my pain she has seen me crying she has seen me in my low moments where i'm just crying uncontrollably i have exposed her to all this and i was feeling so bad for her so i decided now let me not even tell her about the where we are going i just said we are going to uh, mom has gotten a job and we, are, we have to live there until corona is over and she was so excited she was like, hey, mama, God has answered our prayer, blah, blah. So I myself, I didn't even know where I was going. So as I enter the gates of Hope Center, it's a very beautiful place. 
very well, you know, trimmed garden and whatever. As I enter, then I realize it's a shelter. To be honest, I didn't even know we have shelters in Kenya. I would see shelters in movies. I didn't know that, that we had them in Kenya. So I enter and I am welcomed so nicely. You know, there are women there who are happy. Oh, karibu, nini, nini. So I, ha I sit down with the director of the place. And yeah, she now gets to tell me what the center is about. And in my mind, I remember just saying, hey, I'm doing bad things are thick. If I am the one in a shelter today, things are really, really thick. So anyway, that's how I ended up at Hope Center. And uh, I must say that the first prayer I made when I entered that place, I remember asking God that, God, I am here. Remember, I asked you for help, and here is where I've ended. So please let me be a blessing to the people here. That was the pr only prayer I made. So of course, it was, it was hard for, for my, my daughter especially. It was so hard for her because now this is a new environment, blah, blah. But then her father was, was very, very cooperative. And I remember we, we were there on a Tuesday. And the next day on Wednesday, he came to pick her up. Um, so he would bring her over, over the weekends. So I stayed in Hope Center for three months. And I must say that that is where my, my healing began. First, I was a bit ashamed. I must admit, I was so ashamed. Um, I was very, very ashamed of myself that here I am in a shelter. I knew of, of children homes. Yeah. And so a shelter is a children home for grown-ups. So in my mind, I'm like, here I am. <laughs> I'm so ashamed of myself. But then again, I remembered asking God to help me. So that, the fact that I asked for, God help, for God's help for me was like, okay, let's, let's just go with your script, God. It's okay. Yeah, I'm not, this is not what I envisioned, but Nisawa, here I am. So I stayed in Hope Center and I began now my healing. We had uh, therapy sessions where, you know, women would come together and everybody would just, we had group sessions and individual sessions. And I remember my first group session, I was not very open to it. But uh, eventually, I began my healing. I began now unpacking my wounds. I began now, you know, I had to go back to the 11, 12-year-old girl who was defiled. I had to go back to the 13-year-old who wanted her father. I had to go back to the teenager who, you know, was trying to explore sex and just forgetting how sex was introduced to me. I had to go back to embracing myself, loving myself discovering myself you know and just to say vicky you know you're not a bad child you're just different you know when when people are quiet you choose to talk where where people would choose to to be you know to hold secrets you choose to speak it out so i began to understand and and i began to say that okay bad things were done to me i remember the hardest thing for me was even to forgive my dad because I felt for so long, if my dad was in my life, then my stepdad would not have treated me the way he treated me. I began to forgive my dad for not loving me the way I expected him to love me. I forgave my dad for not, for not beating up my stepdad for the things he used to do to me. And at that point, I began now to look at God as my father. I forgave my, my ex-husband for everything. And I remember even before even all this, I remember in 2016, I called him and I, he had come to pick my daughter. And we actually sat down and I asked him for forgiveness. Because I equally played a role to, the, to you know to the ending of my marriage. So I sat him down and I asked him for forgiveness. As I was asking him for forgiveness, I'm not so sure at that point if I had forgiven him as well. But now when I began my therapy, I forgive my ex-husband. I forgive. I had to forgive my mom in her grave for not having that conversation. For not believing me when I said what happened to me happened. 
I forgive myself for being so hard on myself, for thinking that I deserved that treatment. I forgive myself for wanting to end my life. I look at myself sometimes in the mirror and I'm just like, I want to slap myself. I'm like, shame on you. You know, all, you wanted to spoil all this why. And that was now the beginning of just God showing himself in my life and, and for God to say that you are mine. It was a very, very emotional, hard journey for me. And even for my dad, I became I, I began to understand that it was I was I felt entitled to his love, you know. I felt like I was entitled for him to love me. My expectations of of him is what disappointed me and hurt me. Maybe that's just not who he is, you know. Maybe Jim is just not that type of person. It's not his fault. It was actually my expectations and the entitlement I had that actually disappointed me. And so it was, it was a journey of just healing and unpacking and, and just crying, genuinely weeping. And it, it was good. It was good. And I want to thank God, especially because for me, if it was not for God, I would not be seated here today telling my story. Um, I feel like there are so many times and, and there are so many incidences where, because at some point I became very reckless. Eh? The, the, that 2015 year was, hey, I became very reckless. I didn't care how I was living because I was so angry at God. And I was like, if you can take my mother and my sister, you might as well just take me also. So I was so reckless in how I was living. I didn't care. I stopped praying, you know. So I basically ended my relationship with God and for me right now, it's just reconciliation with my father in heaven and just to say that, God, you're there and you're my father and he has held me. I would really love to sit here and say I owe it to myself. Really, I don't. I would love to sit here and say that I am a strong woman and I made it. No, I am not. It is because of my God in heaven. It's because of God. And I sit here and I'm happy because... I am not mad at my mom anymore. I am not sure if I've forgiven my stepfather because that is somebody who I have not seen. The last time I saw him was in 2011. In fact, I had just given birth to my daughter and I remember my brother calling him to come to hospital and I was so mad. But I was so tired because I'd just given birth. So he came in, he brought a very big card and I think flowers. And I remember just, he walked into my room with the big card and he was with my brother with the big card and the flowers. And as soon as he, because now my ex-husband knew about my story. So he just asked them to leave because I, you know, he used the excuse that I need to rest. And immediately he left my room. I remember asking my ex-husband to throw those things away. Far away, not even in, in, the, in the dustbin in my room, but really far away. That's the last time I saw him. Have I forgiven him? Mm, no, I don't think. I'm still struggling with that. Yeah, I'm still mad at him. Um, yeah, so that is something that I'm struggling with, and it will take me some time. I've made peace with my mother. I loved my mother. I know my mother loved me. I am a mother right now, and, and I probably understand that she didn't know any better. I think even for her, she, she just didn't know what to do as a mother. For her, I feel like she just got to a place of she didn't know what to do, and she dealt with it the best way she knew how to. Uh, for my dad, I, I love my father unconditionally. Um, I pray for my father every day. And I know that my father and I, it's a work in progress. Let me just put it that way. My Aunt Agnes, <laughs> ah, that woman, she, she, she held me down. She was, on top of having her own children, again, she had to take up my, you know, my baggage. And she was there for me. She really tried to shield me from whatever I was going through. And for that, Auntie Agnes, I thank you and I love you and may God bless you. To 
Hope Center family consolata who welcomed me with open arms <laughs> despite uh let me say something funny you know uh, I think let me call it pride eh? pride is not a good thing <laughs> these standards that we set for ourselves in life it's not good I remember when I walked into Hope Center it was lunch time and they were having a uh, sima and cabbage I just remember looking, and so they welcomed me. You know, they're happy. This, this is a new guest. In fact, now after I settled in, the ladies there were telling me, you know, when we saw you, we thought you were a donor because you came with a lot of clothes. And <laughs> so I was like, hey, okay. Anyway, so they welcomed me. They offered me food. And I remember just looking at that plate, thinking, hey, <laughs> but anyway, like the Bible says, his plans are not our plans. And I'll sit here and tell you that I enjoyed that. In fact, he, I really used to look forward to lunchtime. That sima and cabbage and, and skuma wiki and what, I really used to look forward to it. And I, and I took a liking to it. So if I didn't end up in Hope Center, I would not be here today. So I, I, I went through my, my therapy. I finished my therapy. And this is again why I say me being in Hope Center was God's plan. Because immediately, I remember December, immediately I finished my, my therapy session. God made a way for me. I got a massive, hey, miraculous breakthrough, financial breakthrough. Yani God just came up for me. He came up, he showed up. Yani he showed up, Kabisa. And so it was time for me to leave the center. I left the center. I got my place, my own place. And today my daughter and I have a home. And we sit and we look at each other and remember. I remember, I think there was a while back we were praying. And my daughter, that, that night she just kept, normally she would pray about the night, not having nightmares. I remember that day she just kept thanking God. Oh, thank you God for being with us even in Hope Center. <laughs> Thank you, God, that we have our own house now. She came to learn later. I must, I must add that. Um, as she used to come over the weekends, you know, now it was, I, like I said, it's a shelter for gender-based uh, violence, yeah? So women who have been violently abused. So she'd come there and she'd play with other kids. So I think in, their, in her interactions with the other children, she must have figured out, I, my mother is not an employee. <laughs> She's actually a resident. So in December on Christmas Day, she spent the day with her dad and his family. Then she was dropped there in the evening. And so when she came, I was dressed up. It was Christmas even for us at the shelter. We were looking nice, we, you know. She came and when we went to the bedroom, she told me, Mom, do you know I know you don't work in Hope Center? I said, Naima, I was too tired to even tell you the truth. She said, it's okay. I just wanted you to know so that when we cross to 2021, <laughs> you just know that I know. I said, okay. So, yeah. Um, I, I'd like to say that I want to speak to... I think let me start with mothers. I want to say that the person who hurts your child is not a stranger. Your child's perpetrator is the loving uncle, is the funny uncle, is the funny neighbor. Your child's perpetrator is somebody who is familiar to the child. So I would like for parents, and I'm not only speaking to mothers, I'm also speaking to fathers. Let's, let's be aware. Let's be aware of the people that are surrounding our children. Let's try and have these conversations. Let's spend time with our kids. Let's, let's talk to our children, both male and female. You know, get to know your child. How was your day? What, what do you like? You know, what happened during the day? Interact with your child. Let's normalize having these conversations for the sake of the well-being of our children. To a young woman who is in a violent marriage, a failed marriage is, is better. It's, it's much better than, than you dying. To be honest, I would not want anybody to be where the space where I was mentally and emotionally. There's nothing as hard as battling your mind. I think it's the hardest thing I've had to do. Just battling your thoughts. You're fighting with your, your thoughts. You're, you're battling with your thoughts. It is 
so exhausting. If there is no solution, if there is no way you can make peace in your marriage, I think it's better to raise healthy children when you separate. Let's have these conversations. Let's talk in our marriages. Let's, let's be open. For me right now, I'm just, I'm encouraging people to talk because I am here, even me as I'm here, I'm talking. And talking helps. And it is through talking that I found my healing. It is through talking that, talking to God is what now, God will not heal what you hide. Let me put it that way. I want to speak to, to the little girl or the woman who has felt rejected by her father. Because for, for girls, your dad is the first man who will love you. Your father is the first man who will, you know, be there for you, protect you. I want to say that let us remember that God is our father. Before our biological fathers, before, let us always remember that God is our father. So it doesn't matter what, how broken your relationship with your parent is. It does not matter. Let us first always remember that before he trusted us with, to our parents, he was there. And I will say that working with God and understanding him and to say that, God, I want to be your friend. I want to walk with you has given me a lot of peace. I am peaceful. I am happy. I am on my journey and I am getting better each day. Am I, am I there yet? Not yet. I'm taking baby steps. Like I said in my introduction, I am the founder of a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful initiative called Mummies with a Purpose. Mummies with a Purpose is we are mothers who have come together to say that, hey guys, this is what we are going through. Let's be there for each other. So we mostly work with women who are incarcerated because they are separated from their children. And we all know how harsh society can be to those children whose brothers are incarcerated. So Mummies with a Purpose, is, it's just an initiative where mothers come together, mothers share, mothers cry together, mothers help each other, we network, you know, we do a lot of charity. And basically that's what Mummies with a Purpose is. We are just being, our purpose is to become better people and better mothers to our children for us to raise better, better children. For me, my greatest joy is just having an open forum where children can actually talk about how they feel, their environments at home and how they make them feel and just trying to make it better for these children. For me, that is what just gives me joy, to be honest. My reason for sharing my story is um, mainly just to inspire somebody and to encourage somebody to say that you are not alone. You are not alone. You are a mother, you are there, you are broke, you are jobless, you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Imagine you are not alone, I've been there. You are a mother, you are looking at your children, and we've seen these stories in the news where a mother wants to kill herself and her children. There is help. There is help. If I am the one seated here today, there is help. And even you can get help. I am there. Mummies with a Purpose is there. I am Vicky Tenya on all my social media platforms. Please DM me, follow, whatever. As in, I'm there. Let's, don't, don't die alone. And there is no shame. There is n absolutely no shame in admitting that, yes, I am not mentally okay. There is no shame. In, in fact, I, for me, I feel like it takes a very brave person to come out and say that, hey, guys, I need help. So I am sharing my story to inspire and to encourage somebody out there and to just remind you that there is God in heaven. If you cannot come and share, then just, just whatever you are, just talk to your father in heaven. He answers very, very, very fast. As I conclude this, I would like to, first of all, thank, of course, God and thank my pastor, Pastor Peter Dera. Dr. Stella Kerongo, who walked with me throughout my journey, she held my hand. She actually, I learned from Dr. Stella that it's okay not to be okay. It's very okay not to be okay. And so, Dr. Stella, I thank you. I want to thank Consolata Wangari for opening the doors for Hope Center to me. Um, the father of my child. Thank you for understanding that I was not well. 
thank you for stepping up say when you did it must not have been easy for you but thank you <laughs> and thank you for supporting what i'm doing right now even thank you and and for you just you know shared moments thank you for this opportunity to just allowing god to use you people to change and impact people's lives for me i think i mean just being on this platform in itself it's 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 incredible and my daughter i want to thank naima i love you thank you you're an amazing child you are so wonderful and so special then just know i love you and every day i wake up and i want to be a better mother to you in in 2019 pastor pit kept saying everything you're going through Vicky, you're about to walk into your purpose. You're about to enter your purpose. And I remember one time looking at him and wanting to slap him because I am broke, homeless. Where is the purpose in this? I was so mad. <laughs> Pastor Pete, forgive me. But that day, I looked at my purpose and I was like, what is this dude talking about? Which purpose? But as the Bible says, in his own time, he makes all things beautiful. I didn't know. Then if you told me I'd, I'd be this type of person today, I didn't think so. But now I know my pastor was right and I have found my purpose. Yeah.